Okay, this is Dr. Vermilio. In this lecture, we will discuss selected disorders of the auditory system. Uh, there's something called a site of lesion, which is the area of the auditory system that is damaged. So if you're asked, what was the site of lesion, that means, okay, there was a problem with the auditory system. Where exactly was the problem? Was the problem in the outer ear, the middle ear, in the cochlea, the eighth nerve, uh, central auditory pathways, or was it in multiple portions of the audit auditory system? Again, cytal lesion is the location of the problem in the auditory system. Uh, here's some terms for you. Differential diagnosis uh, involves determining which part or parts of the auditory system are affected. This is accomplished by doing a variety of audi uh, auditory tests. Uh, case history, this is where the audiologist uh, will obtain information about the patient's complaints and familial history of hearing disorders. Uh, genetic hearing loss or hereditary hearing loss or familial hearing loss. Uh, this is uh, hearing loss due to differences in the genes that are passed on through a hereditary source. Uh, terms uh, continued congenital hearing loss present at birth due to factors present before or during birth. Early onset hearing loss appears during early childhood. Late onset uh, genetic hearing loss appears during late childhood or as an adult. Uh, this last bullet point, this is one of the reasons why it's so important to take a case history. You might find that your patient's uh, mother had a hearing loss that started in her 40s, and then you find out your patient is in her 40s. There's a chance that something could be happening that's related to this uh, gen her genetic makeup. Okay, acquired hearing loss uh, is hearing loss that is not of genetic or congenital or origin. Idiopathic means uh, it's a loss uh, and the cause is unknown. Okay, test battery uh, includes a case history, otoscopic visualization of the canal, uh, it may inclu include a tuning fork test, uh, the Weber test, and the RINA test, uh, the audiogram, that's where we're going to obtain air and bone conduction thresholds, we're going to mask if necessary, the speech detection threshold, uh, or the speech recognition threshold uh, will be determined, usually you, you don't do both. Um, if the patient has the vocabulary to, to uh, understand or recognize the test words, then you use the speech recognition threshold. A word recognition score, uh, this is presented in percent word correct, uh, percent of percentage of words correct from a, a, the, the list, and the words are presented at a super threshold level. And then, of course, we reviewed uh, speech recognition and noise testing. There are various speech recognition and noise tests out there. Uh, also, we'll do tympanometry, acoustic reflexes, acoustic reflex thresholds, autoacoustic emissions uh, measurements, and possibly the auditory brainstem response if we were suspecting a retrocochlear cytal lesion, or we might conduct an auditory brainstem response, uh, for example, for a, a very young child, an infant, if we're trying to estimate pure tone thresholds. Uh, test results for a patient with an acoustic neuroma. So let's look at some test results for a patient. An acoustic neuroma, also called a vestibular schwannoma, is a tumor on the vestibular branch of the eighth auditory nerve. Okay, in, in this case, the patient reported that his hearing decreased in his left ear since he was last tested six months ago. He also complained of a plugged sensation in his left ear. He has trouble communication, communicating in noisy environments and has recently noticed a great deal of difficulty understanding over the telephone uh, with the left ear. He noticed increasing difficulty hearing since first failing a hearing screening at work five years ago. He was also aware of increasing tinnitus or tinnitus, remember that's ringing in the ears, over the past two years, and then suddenly noticed that the hearing in the left ear had become significantly poorer than the right. Okay, so um, let's go on. Although his left ear feels plugged, he has had no pain or drainage. 
He periodically hears a high-pitched ringing or chirping sound in both ears. That's interesting. Uh, a number of my patients have talked about a chirping tinnitus. Uh, it lasts for only a few seconds, according to uh, the patient. So here's the otoscopy. Uh, so we're looking down the ear canal of the right ear and the left ear. So both ear canals are clear, so we do not expect a conductive hearing loss, at least due to a problem in the ear canal. AD is aurus dextra. It's a Latin word. It means uh, right ear. Okay, and aurus sinistra is uh, the left ear. And the word sinistra is, is, uh, has become used to... Uh, that's, that's where the word sinister is from. Okay, tuning fork tests. Uh, the Weber and the Rinna were administered, and uh, the Weber test midline, so we see an M here. So when the tuning fork was at 250 hertz, the patient heard the tuning fork tone in the center of his head for 500 hertz, uh, uh, same thing. And then in the Rinna, recall that with the Rinna test, the, the tines or the, or the fork part of the tuning fork uh, was was, you know, the vibrations are started, it's placed near the opening of the ear canal, and then the stem of the tuning fork is placed on the mastoid bone, and the patient heard uh, through air conduction louder than bone conduction. So that is called, that, that's called a positive rena. So we're, we're actually not suspecting uh, any type of conductive loss uh, due to these responses. Now, this doesn't say that the patient has normal hearing, and it doesn't say that there's an absence of a relatively symmetrical hearing loss. Notice that we're only testing at 250 and 500 hertz. Okay, so the Weber, uh, to sum up again, the Weber midline indicates no conductive component for 250 and 500 hertz. This is confirmed with the Rinna test, where air uh, the air conduction sound was perceived as louder than the bone conduction sound for each ear. Tympanogram. Uh, for our patient with an acoustic neuroma, relatively normal tympanograms for both ears. This indicates normal flow of sound energy into the middle ear cavity. This is insufficient, however, to rule out a conductive loss, a good conductive hearing loss. We'll need to look for an air bone gap on the audiogram in order to determine the presence of a conductive component. Though a conductive po component is probably unlikely because of the results of the tuning fork tests. Acoustic reflexes, recall that we are looking at the uh, pathways of the acoustic reflex arc from the eighth nerve up the brainstem, down the brainstem, to the seventh nerve, to the stapes muscle. We're looking for a reduction in admittance when the stapedius muscle pulls on the ossicular chain. Uh, and this in the in the ear canal would change the level, would stiffen up the eardrum, which would change the level of the probe tone, recall that. And as the probe tone goes up, we're inferring that admittance is going down. Okay, uh, acoustic reflexes. Uh, again, the patient has an acoustic neuroma, and here's the probe uh, is in the right ear, probe is in the left ear. And you can see when the probe is in the right ear, uh, we have reflexes at 80 dBHL for the IPSI and 90 dBHL contra. So when the sound is presented, the reflex of listening tone is presented to the left ear, uh, the patient uh, showed a change in admittance in the right ear. When the 500 hertz was presented to, to the right ear, we, uh, we saw a change in admittance in the right ear. The lowest level was at 80 dBHL. And we see uh, reflex thresholds Throughout uh, Contra at 2,000 hertz, we don't see it. We're missing it. And when the probe is in the left ear, there are absolutely no uh, acoustic reflex thresholds at all uh, when, the, when the tone is, was presented to the uh, patient. Uh, we're not really, we don't have an indication of how high of a level the tone was presented, but over the range that they tested, there, was no, there were no responses. So NR, no response. No acoustic reflexes were found when the probe tone was delivered to the left ear. This indicates a problem somewhere along the acoustic reflex pathways from the cochlea to the stapedius muscle. So when the probe is in the left, there's something wrong with the acoustic reflex arc somewhere. Okay, audiograms. 
look at the audiograms. Uh, similar in that the right ear and the left ear both uh, show a, uh, a high frequency loss and it's a sensory neural hearing loss. We're not sure exactly where the, the site of lesion is, but it could be the cochlea, it could be the eighth nerve, it could be the pathways in the auditory brainstem, and it could be, or it could be in the cortex, right? But look at this. At 2,000 hertz, the threshold for the right ear is uh, 15 dB. And look at 2,000 hertz. The threshold for the right ear was... Oh, way down here. This mass threshold was 65 dB. So that's that's a marked asymmetry. A marked asymmetry. So it's poor in the left ear. Okay. So this is the first indication that we've had that the left ear was poorer than the right ear in one of these tests. Notice uh, down here, these are the effective uh, masking levels for air conduction and bone conduction. So this means that uh, a plateau was reached uh, for this uh, air conduction frequency at 2000 Hertz a plateau was reached and the last level of the noise at the end of the uh, plateau was 45 dB H <coughs> excuse me HL and for bone conduction you see these masked bone conduction symbols these brackets uh, the noise was presented at 95 dB HL at the end of the plateau. Notice the asymmetrical pure tone threshold at 2000 and 3000 Hertz and the question is what's causing this asymmetry? Okay, word recognition scores. Uh, let's see, I, we don't see any SRTs reported. Okay, so maybe they, they didn't test it for some reason. Normally you would do that to confirm the pure tone thresholds by looking at the SRT comparing it to the two frequency average pure tone average uh, two frequency pure tone average which would be for 500 and 1000 Hertz or the three frequency pure tone average looking at 500 1000 and 2000 Hertz so anyway this wasn't done for some reason uh, the words were uh, word recognition score the words were presented at a fixed level at 50 dB HL in the right ear the patient understood 96 percent of the words cool and then for some reason we don't have uh, 50 dB HL was not measured here on the left ear. They went right to 80 dB HL for some reason. I don't really understand that. But anyway, they went to 80 dB HL. Look at that word recognition score. 32%. Okay, and then at 90 dB HL, they presented the words 100% word recognition ability in the right ear and only 44% in the left. So the words were presented at 90 dB HL. So the words were presented over here. So imagine that speech banana down here, right around 90. And we'd say that well, most of the speech bananas should have been, most of the frequency components in speech, according to this visual image of the speech banana, would be audible because it would all be above the threshold. Same thing over here, speech banana right here. We'd say most of the frequency components would be audible. But even though they're audible, uh, we're looking at some sort of distortion in the auditory system. So remember we saw this uh, asymmetry for 2000 hertz on the pure tone thresholds, poor in the left ear, and now we're seeing uh, this distortion or poor speech recognition ability in quiet at a high presentation level for the left ear. Okay, so the plot thickens. Okay, and then also we would ask the question, is the pure tone average within 7 to 10 dB of the SRT? But of course we can't determine that because it wasn't measured. Okay, and then uh, note, is there, a, so here's a question, is there a significant difference in the word recognition scores between ears at 90 dB HL? And so how do you know if it's significant? Again, you can go back and look at Thornton and Raffin. Okay, of course we would need to know what, what the uh, word lists were, how many words were presented. Okay, acoustic, autoacoustic emissions, uh, the right ear. Uh, look at these autoacoustic emissions. Uh, relatively robust in the lower frequencies. This is frequency, this is amplitude of the DPOAEs, but for the higher frequencies, it's, uh, they're, they're really reduced over here. So high frequency uh, autoacoustic emissions or high frequency out of here cells show a reduction in functional ability. And this, this is probably secondary to exposure to high levels of sound, right? And look at the left ear. Uh, even uh, 
less functionality of the outer hair cells, and no responses in the hives. Well, that's interesting. So the autoacoustic emissions, maybe there was greater noise exposure on the left ear. Why, why are the, the um, autoacoustic auto emissions so poorly functioning? Okay, let's go back to that. So what do DPOAEs measure? Well, distortion product autoacoustic emissions measure outer hair cell function. Are the DPOAEs at the same amplitude in DBSPL across test frequencies? No, they're, they're higher in amplitude in the lows than in the highs, especially for the right ear. And what do the results indicate? Well, the results would indicate poorly functioning outer hair cells, especially in the high frequencies for both ears. Here's the brainstem response to condensation clicks. Remember, the, the click is now, uh, the diaphragm goes towards the eardrum and then back to the resting spot for a condensation click. So it goes click, the earphone moves in, and, and uh, the diaphragm moves in and out real quickly. And here's the brainstem response for the right ear and for the left ear. That's kind of interesting looking brainstem response. Uh, what was the level? Oh, the level, the level was very high, 95 dB normalized hearing level. The rate of the click was 10.1 clicks per second. Uh, and then there was filters. So the electrical information from the filters, what, excuse me, from the electrodes were sent through a filter. Uh, and the bandwidth was 100 to 3,000 hertz. So anything outside that bandwidth was rejected, and there was 2,048 2, sweeps. That means that there were 2,048, at least 2,048 clicks. The earphones used were TDH50s, the, the old-fashioned World War II radio uh, operator earphones. And here's wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four, wave five. Are the waveforms repeatable? Uh, yeah, it's definitely repeatable. Yeah, definitely repeatable. So here's the brainstem a response for the right ear. Wave 5 is uh, closer to 6, maybe a little higher than 6 milliseconds. So that's a little delayed, probably related in part to the uh, high frequency loss. And so it would take uh, the, the ear canal or the, the ABR a little bit longer to uh, be seen uh, timing wise than if there was no damage to the cochlea. But look at the left. ABR. Okay, is that a wave one? Well, yeah, I, I, that looks pretty repeatable. Is this a wave two? Well, no, that's not repeatable. And then the, uh, whoever reviewed this claims that this is a wave three. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. And then wave five? Now, this, I really don't get this. N no. I don't think this is a repeatable wave five. So at best, the ABR is abnormal and it might even be considered absence uh, for these later uh, components. Okay, so again, we're pointing towards the left ear uh, having a problem here. This is for condensation clicks. Okay, uh, well, let me review again. This graph shows the amplitude and voltage of the ABR over time following stimulation by a condensation click where the earphone diaphragm moves towards the TM initially. Is there a difference between the wave five when wave five appears for the right ear versus the left ear? If there is a delay, what could be causing the delay? Is the waveform of the ABR repeatable for the right ear? What about the left ear? Okay, so these are things we, we discussed. Okay, now here's the ABR to rarefaction clicks. So the diaphragm moves away from the eardrum and then towards the, the resting point again. The level of this is the same. The, uh, the, uh, it's 95 dB normalized hearing level. The rate is the same, 10.1 uh, clicks per second. The filters are the same. The sweeps are the same. Th these parameters are very important. If they were different between ears, we could not make a comparison between ears. But because they're the same between ears, we can make uh, a comparison. Okay, uh, wave one, wave three, wave five. Are these repeatable? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say they're fairly repeatable. What about two, where's four? Uh, not, no, I don't see anything there. Okay, uh, wave one for the left ear, uh, I'm not sure I buy that. You see how subjective this is? Okay, so I don't, I don't see how this is repeatable. Okay, wave three, I, I don't really see it. Wave five, yeah, I think I think I actually would buy that this, see as it drops off here, I would buy that that's wave 5. So look at wave 5 versus wave 
uh, wave five for the left ear versus wave five for the right ear, there's actually a significant or a marked uh, latency delay for the left ear. Why is it taking so long for that that uh, the part of the brainstem to fire off relative to the to the uh, brainstem on the right side? Well, there's probably something there, right? So this graph shows the amplitude and voltage of the AVR over time following stimulation by a rarefaction click where the earphone di diaphragm moves away from the TM initially. Is there a difference in when wave 5 appears for the right ear versus the left ear? Uh, if there is a delay, what could be causing the, the delay? Is the waveform of the ABR repeatable for the right ear? Yeah, I'd say it's pretty repeatable. What about the left ear? Uh, I'd say only for wave 5 it's really repeatable. Okay, uh, this is a little graph that shows the latency of the different uh, wave uh, components. So wave 1, wave 3, wave 5, X would be the left ear, 0 or the open circle would be the right ear, X is the left ear, and then the shaded region is what's normal, is what we would expect at a level of 90 dB uh, NHL. This is actually kind of a handy graph. So you can see that the waveform is delayed because it's later than normal for both uh, ears for wave 1. This is for rarefaction, okay, rarefaction clicks. Wave 3, uh, the right ear is on the edge of normal, left ear is, is, is definitely delayed. Uh, and this really tells the story right here, wave 5, right? That's within normal limits. Uh, but the for wave five, but the uh, for the right ear, but the left ear is definitely delayed. Okay, so what is the wave in wave five interoral latency difference? Uh, that's this right here: one to three, three to five, one to five. The inter oh, excuse me. What is the wave five interoral latency difference? Well, what you would do is you take this and subtract this, and then that uh, gives you the interoral latency difference in milliseconds. And then uh, left wave 5 latency minus uh, right wave 5 latency. So that gives you the latency difference. That's how you determine it. Okay, and that's our uh, case study for a patient with an acoustic neuroma for the left ear. And you got to see how uh, we tell the story using all the different uh, test protocols uh, that typically is done in an uh, audiology clinic, especially in a medical center.